Sergeant and Mrs. Smith, you are going to love this house. Is that a tub in the kitchen? There's no field manual for finding the right home. But when you do, USAA Homeowners Insurance can help protect it the right way. Restrictions apply. Ow. Those uncomfortable things we do for beauty. Oof. Ouch. And when it comes to whiter teeth, same story. Until now. Enjoy wince-free whitening with new Sensodyne Clinical White. You'll get clinically proven whitening technology in an enamel-safe formula for two shades whiter teeth and 24-7 sensitivity protection. <sighs> Sensodyne Clinical White. A whiter smile without the wince. Hello and welcome to the Growth Mindset Podcast with me, your host, Samuel Webster-Harris. As always, diving into the psychology and practicalities of self-improvement. Last episode, I spoke about some of the biggest lessons from the legend that is Socrates, who is, of course, famous for being one of the fathers of the Stoic philosophy movement and philosophy in general. But also, as I pointed out, a massive advocate for growth mindset thinking and a lot of very practical steps for how to embrace a growth mindset in your life. He is the man famous for saying that an unexamined life is not worth living and he worked relentlessly to uncover his unquestioned assumptions, misconceptions, inconsistencies and contradictions in his own thinking and those of the people around him. So one of the truly greatest growth mindset thinkers that ever lived, perhaps. But today... I'm going to have a bit of a different episode talking about the last days of Socrates and his life in general and going through the book, which is the only recorded work of Socrates as written by his student Plato. This episode is going to be a bit different. It's actually going to be a discussion between me and my co-host Nicholas Farik, who co-hosts a different podcast with me called the Wiser Than Yesterday podcast, where every episode we review a book on philosophy and self-improvement or something like that. And we did a whole series on ancient philosophy and Stoics, and one of the books was The Last Days of Socrates, as it was recommended by some very good thinkers of the modern age. And it was a really interesting book to find out more about this man that lived two and a half thousand years ago and was a teacher of Alexander the Great and founded such powerful movements. If you're into your history at all, I think this episode will be really interesting. It will be a bit different to the average kind of episode that I have but I still think there's plenty of lessons on psychology and mindset and general practicalities of being a better human being so without further ado I hope you enjoy the episode. Hello everyone I'm Nico as usual I'm joined by my co-host Sam and today we're starting our adventure in the world of ancient philosophy books with the book The Last Days of Socrates which was written by Plato. The book consists of four parts the Euthrypo, the Apology, Crito, and Phaedo. And Sam and myself, we stumbled upon an audio version, which we listened, which after reading it only contains the Apology and the Phaedo. So the second part and the fourth part. And so we're going to be discussing those parts in this short episode. So the Last Days of Socrates, the whole book talks about, as the title says, the Last Days of Socrates. So Socrates was put on trial by the city of Athens for heresy and the corruption of youth in the first part. So the Euthypro, it talks about the conversation he has with Euthypro right before his trial begins. In the Apology, the second part of the book, he basically stands on trial and he talks to the judges. So the Athenians that will be judging him, although the name suggests that he's very much apologizing for what he did, it's actually not the case, as we'll go more in depth into later. The third part Crito, he is imprisoned. So after his apology, he is actually sentenced to death. And so he did manage to convince the Athenians. And in the Crito, some of his friends tried to release him and break him free from jail so he can flee. And there in that part, he actually says that he doesn't want to flee because it will be unjust. And in the last part, the Phaedo, which we also listened to, he discusses the concept of the soul and how it is actually, to call it, it is immortal. So yeah, those are the four parts. Sam, do you have anything to add? Yes. Just when you're talking about like the trial to the judges, I think it's worth mentioning or clarifying that is it like it's got 500 
Athenians who are like members of the public, but they're all his judges. As in, they kind mm-hmm. of decide it's like a much bigger version of a jury, but they're actually the judge at the same time. Just because that's like quite different to what we would conceive of as a judges. So sort of like like Parliament, where you have like all the people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, what's the politicians? <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> this is a good start. Yes, sounding so, very yes. smart right now. <laughs> I know, right? Good. Well, this leads nicely into his first argument that. Wisdom is knowing your lack of wisdom. I've become aware that I'm not very wise this morning. So yes. I must be at least a little bit wise compared yes. to people that aren't aware of these things. That's nice a to, nice uh, setup. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very good. So w- what happens in the apology is that Socrates addresses everything that he's, he's convicted of. And the first point he makes that he's not really convicted of heresy and corruption of the youth. But his first and foremost crime is basically being a pain in the butt of everything, everyone in Athens. Because he tells a story of where the oracle of Delphi calls him the wisest man on the planet. And Socrates, he says that he doesn't believe the oracle. And he sets out on a path to find someone who is wiser than him to prove the oracle wrong. And so that is his mission in life, to find people that are wiser than him. And what actually happens is that he finds people that are supposed to be wise but don't seem to be wise at all. And so in that way, he talks to politicians, he talks to other philosophers, he talks to craftsmen, and he basically steps on their toes and annoys them by proving without a doubt that they are actually not wise at all and they don't know anything of of what they talk about. And so Socrates says that that was his first and foremost crime, and that's why everyone doesn't like him, and that's why he's being put on trial. Yeah, 100%. you can see why uh, Taleb likes him. <laughs> That's all yes. he spends his time doing. It's like, oh, these people are stupid. These people are stupid as well. <laughs> but I must say the text itself is one big monologue. So it's all Socrates who is talking to a crowd. And I must say it's quite impressive how he builds up arguments and how he starts mm. and convinces you of how right he is. We kind of lied when we said that his first point was this. And technically his first point when he starts his speech is like, oh, I'm not very good with words, so excuse me if I'm not very good at this. (laughs) And then he just proceeds to be like an absolute genius with everything (laughs) he he says. Well, I mean, you started with a lie, mate. So (laughs) otherwise, yeah, he's very convincing. And yeah, it does feel like he sort of just does annoy people with how right he is the whole way. And people like kind of know that he's right, but he just challenges what they're like expecting, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. He's just being like unusual. And he's more feel like he's accused of being different and not using his wisdom for what everyone else uses their wisdom for. Just because he refuses to go into politics or business or like try and make money on these things. He just doesn't fit in. And then people kind of want him to be like they are. And so they feel like more justified in their mm-hmm. wisdom of doing things they're doing. And so he just makes everyone feel kind of crap. And <laughs> he's just guilty mm-hmm. of being like a weirdo, but also like making people feel like they're doing the wrong thing. They mm-hmm. prefer to feel like they are doing the right thing. I think it's very applicable to today as well, right? People that don't fit in with society are usually judged in a negative way. And when they find good reasoning or good arguments for what they're doing, people get offended. Yeah, yeah. People prefer to try and like make it as it is currently and they get annoyed by things like a vegetarian or a vegan or something. And then they kind of, you make them feel like they're on trial for being a meat eater or something. And you're like, well, yes. kind of like there's a good reason for it. But then people kind of get like offended by you mm. having your views and things. I don't know how well this will work, but I was using different files for my podcast. And one of them was the speech that just happens to be really relevant for um, this. All right. Yes, Father, I'm guilty. Guilty? Is that what you want to hear? You admit you poisoned the king? No, of that I'm innocent. I'm guilty of a far more monstrous crime. I'm guilty of being a dwarf. You are not on trial for being a dwarf. Oh, yes I am. I've been on trial for that my entire life. Anyway, if you get it just made me like just, just people not fitting in and being mm-hmm. accused of the wrong things the whole mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's super applicable. Mm-hmm. I didn't, didn't think of that. So what what we heard was uh, I don't know which episode. Don't even know oh, which. Oh God, season. Yeah, season. Yes. <laughs> I mean, uh, his father's still alive, and there are quite <laughs> a few people still alive at this point. So true. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so it's yeah, it's very applicable. So it was Tyrion. Yeah, Tyrion uh, which was put on trial. Yeah, put on trial for killing Joffrey and high treason by his father. And uh, yeah, he just sort of said that his whole life. He's just been sort of put down because of the fact that he's a dwarf and he doesn't like live up to expectations and people want him to be normal. And he's also 
the intelligent one that's always being smart and people just get pissed off by him being smart. So he's sort of making his defense that like, actually, I have nothing to do with the actual truck like crime, but you just assume it's me because you don't like me. I, I hadn't thought about this deeper, but it's, it's true that it's a concept that happens quite often where people like are disliked for a certain reason, but you cannot be tried for that. It's like, it's not a crime to be. Yeah, yeah. It happens way. so much time with like kids and stuff and like, yeah. bullied to things as in. Where someone is annoying, but you can't punish them for being annoying, but then they get punished extra hard whenever they do something that is punishable. Mm. And I think this is exactly what's happening to Socrates and in this case, to Tyrion as well. Good. <laughs> well, episode no, over. No, Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it relates a bit to, well, maybe, his arguments around being a good influence on the young. Some of these were kind of interesting. At this point, most of the things he's just talking about himself, but with this, he really goes on the offensive of just making the other person look like an idiot who accused him of this and sort of claims that he has no clue what a good example is and isn't even one himself and doesn't really know what the point of helping young people is. And then he kind of then moves into sort of just saying that it's a bit of a weird argument when you actually unpack it. But the way he says it, it becomes across like great. But basically what he claims is that he isn't intentionally being a bad influence if he is at all. And so if he's not doing it deliberately, then he can't be accused of anything. But you're like, well, if you're being a dick, you're like, you're not intentionally raping people. You still rape someone, so that would be bad. Mm -hmm. So it seems like a stupid argument at like the meta level. But like, as he says it, it becomes very convincing. You're like, oh, well, yeah, he's, he's a great guy, this guy. <laughs> That's also something I noticed. So he takes things quite literal and he takes things to the extreme quite often. And I don't have a good example for this, but like, he often builds up arguments like this. Like, if this is the case, then in, in the extreme example, it will also still be the case. So in that way, I've proved my point. So, something like that. <laughs> I should have gotten an example for this. But it's his style of talking to people and especially building up arguments. I think this brings us because the, the first part is mostly monologue. So it's almost all the time uh, Socrates is talking. And so with there, he can build up his own argument. But I think where the book becomes one more complex, but also more interesting is when in the second part of the book that we listen to, so the Phaedo, he basically is in his prison cell and some of his friends come and visit him and they talk to him about what's going to happen to him, about death, about the soul, etc. And so next to the concepts that they talk about, which is the uh, in immortality of the soul, I think one of the interesting parts of that is, is how Socrates actually builds up arguments with other people there instead of doing it by himself. And so what he does is actually, he doesn't say his opinion at all. So the way he proves a point is by asking people questions the whole time. And he asks people yes, no questions. And when they agree, he builds upon that answer to go further further in his argumentation. Yeah, he's very leading with like, well, if you do this, would it not be that you would want to do this? And they go, oh, yes, this is what I'm doing. <laughs> but would it not be to mean that this is what was, is the case? <laughs> and you're like, oh, dear, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Nice. Yeah, so for example, the, the people that are there that uh, really like him, are concerned with his soul. So with the soul of Socrates and what will happen to it after death. And he says, well, don't you think that the soul is immortal? And they're not very sure about that. And so then he starts building up the argument on why that is. And I wish that we could do it here, but <laughs> it basically takes an hour or uh, a few dozens of pages to build up the whole argument. And so but <laughs> that made it quite difficult to follow, in my opinion. So as you know, Sam and myself, we listen to books, so we do the audiobook way. And so the... The whole second part of the book that we listen to talks about, well, it's building up arguments. And so it's like Socrates asks someone to agree to a certain point. And once they agree, he starts building on top of that. And so he keeps building on previous points, which makes it very difficult to listen to it. Because if you zone out for just a minute, like you can't follow the argument anymore. You miss something very important because they keep referring to, ah, oh, because we've already made it so that before someone is born, the soul isn't created out of nothing, et cetera, et cetera. So it's quite interesting how he builds up arguments, but it's also quite difficult to follow because it starts, like it, it goes on for a very long trail of thought. It's, it's nice though, when you are following it, it's a, yes. sort of take you on a bit of a journey that I guess it kind of keeps you blind to what's wrong about it. Like as we were saying, and then you sort of always feel like it's like the right path. You don't actually kind of, you're not aware of all the possibilities that you sort of actually should be considering. You kind of go like, you specifically look at like just the one thing you're saying, you're like, oh, this is always right. And you kind of can miss the fact that he's maybe skipping out on something. But some of his stuff is actually quite useful and makes a lot of sense. And he certainly was a very ahead thinker of his time and follows thoughts and pathways of logic. In terms of like all the scientific explorations of 
like how they prove theories from like Newton and like Einstein and stuff where they did a lot of stuff just theoretically. He sort of he really set up like that kind of thinking, which you know, okay, a lot of the Greek mathematicians and stuff also did in terms of just thought experiments, but just sort of realizing that actually a lot of the ways people were thinking back then weren't really that correct. It just didn't follow their thoughts to the logical conclusion. Like I said, and sometimes he maybe isn't quite right, but a lot of the times actually he is thinking of stuff that people should have been thinking about and just get them scared by and just happy to delude themselves into being the way they are. But yeah, did you get like what he was saying about all the the, the stuff about form? When he first talked about the soul, then he talks about form and like three is both three and it is also odd. So you can kind of call it two things, but it could never be even or you can, can't like admit its opposite form. And But he makes a very long argument about this and it seems like, okay, yeah, I get, get that. <laughs> I feel like he was probably trying to teach me something deeper. No, I must say I didn't fully understand everything, except especially in the second part. I found it sometimes pretty hard to follow or to get what he was saying or what he was meaning. So sorry, can't help you there, Sam. Okay, well, Not no worries. Enough. This episode is brought to you by the Weather Channel. What does the Weather Channel app share in common with a personal trainer and a life coach? It's an ally on your quest to wellness. What you do with this insight is up to you. Like running an extra mile when air quality is good or checking your allergy forecast so not even ragweed can disrupt your chi. It's more than a weather app. What in the weather are you waiting for? Be a force of nature with the Weather Channel app. This episode is brought to you by Accenture. A better you starts with better hydration. Accenture is on a mission to inspire people to do what matters most. Their proprietary ionization process transforms water from any source into ionized alkaline water, providing water that's 99.9% pure with a pH of 9.5 or higher. Essentia Overachieving H2O, the number one ionized alkaline water. Shop now. Luckily, I have one other genius insight from the second part. So I didn't realize until just now as I was preparing that there's so many similarities to Jesus and the Last Supper at this point, where Jesus is with his disciples and they all know he's about to be killed. And he's sort of telling them how it's okay that he's going to be killed by the Romans that he's trying to help and that he's sort of helping the world. So Jesus is like this figure who kind of knows everything and is this brilliant person. His disciples are aware of how good he is and follow him, but they're like, they're a bit stupid. And like, they kind of try to do as he does. And then there's everyone else in the world that's just idiots doing the wrong thing and he's trying to turn it, change them. And like Socrates is here, like this genius, and he's got like these people with him who sort of believe what he's doing and they're trying to be like him, but they're not as good at it. And they kind of just, they accept every word he says is like there's genius and they love him. And then everyone else in the world, he's trying to change and they just don't accept him for it and they kill him. And it's like, it's the exact same scenario, basically. And you're like, oh, <laughs> it's the Bible story. <laughs> so yeah. there you go, insight. <laughs> One of the things that struck me was I found it pretty hard to read the book. When I was reading the book, I didn't really think about it as a book that was written more than 2,000 years ago. Yeah, I'm not sure it's because of the translation has just made it sort of more acceptable. Yeah. Because so, obviously it was written in a completely different language anyway, whereas if you read like Shakespeare, it sounds sort of Shakespearean. Yeah, but I think I didn't appreciate the insights. I didn't realize how revolutionary his thoughts were for his time, basically. So I think if you know what people knew in ancient Athens, I think what Socrates was saying was groundbreaking. Yeah, yeah his, all his talk about the gods was really interesting as in like, of course I believe the gods because everyone believes in the gods, but then he sort of talks about like, he doesn't accept the gods quite in the same way that they do. And they get very annoyed by that. And he's like, well, obviously like the god, the sun god, he's a god, but like some of the other gods, well, maybe, but yeah, obviously gods will exist and I love God. But for us, it seems a bit odd. But he's doing mm-hmm. that, but he still has like very revolutionary thoughts around the way we should yeah. accept gods and deal with them kind of thing. Yeah, it's true. So for me, if the book would have been written today, it wouldn't be as good. It's just that for his time, it was so revolutionary and so interesting and so much different than what people were thinking. Like, and that's what makes this a good book. And I think that's a common theme that we'll see in a lot of the uh, very influential philosophy books of the ancients, where the content itself are not necessarily groundbreaking for us as modern people because we've already been influenced by more modern philosophies. Yeah, and science and knowledge about things. Exactly. And so for us, these might not be groundbreaking, but... If it was only like a few hundred years ago that we worked out what gravity was, then then if you think about like 3,000 years ago, it's sort of a very different scenario. And Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. just killing slaves and having slaves is a totally normal thing. And women... exactly. Things are definitely very different. One thing following on with like the, well, sort of a bit of a random tangent point, but he does 
claim as well as his like oracle thing he also claims a bit of a, like an inside magic power of that he has a, like an amazing innate voice inside him which he says tells him what to do and people kind of accept that he has this magic power it basically it stops him from doing things that he shouldn't and he claims that this is one of the reasons why he doesn't go into trying to make money or politics and stuff because of every time he's thought about it it's sort of come and it's told not to but he then goes on to say that part of as his argument his innate voice hasn't come to tell him to stop saying the things he's saying so he says i stand by my beliefs and everything i've said because of nothing's telling me to stop and so it must really be the best thing so he basically makes this argument that like he's got this inner power and it's telling him to do what he's doing right then so he clearly is doing the right thing which right now would not stand up in a court at all. It would sound like, okay, well, maybe you should go see like a, a therapist or <laughs> clearly got issues. But the time is sort of, it's interesting. You should sort of can argue that. Uh-huh. And also goes into the Messiah-like things of having like an inner channel to something of a higher power. What are uh, for you like the main takeaways from uh, reading this? I guess I really like the way he constructs arguments and it does teach you a lot about has to be more convincing in choosing what battles to fight because he that needs to set up battles that he just likes fighting and like he mm. just enjoys doing it and i guess he sort of made his decisions and he likes to stick by them which is sort of what he then goes on to sort of discussing a bit more broadly in the second part of like when he's accepting his death and that this is what he wants to do because he has the option to run away or he could have accepted different charges if he sort of plead for them. But he's like, well, I, I wouldn't want to be in exile because of like I'm kind of old near the end of my life and I wouldn't do anything useful anyway. I like being here and doing useful things. And to be honest, dying is going to be a more useful example and stuff. So he sort of accepts his death as just like, well, yeah, probably it's fine. I'll be a bit bored outside. And yeah, so I think it's kind of nice to see that he also discusses honor a lot as well and the honor of a man he certainly thinks a lot more about the long term rather than like the short term right now about how he's feeling and i think like honor was certainly like a much bigger thing back then and people did die for the sake of like their own name and their family's name rather than just sort of running away and it, it is just interesting the way like i do wonder if we'd ever have heard of him if he didn't accept these things if he'd gone to trial if he'd been this person his whole life because it, it sounds like he was this amazing human the whole time but we've only heard about him just because of this this one piece of like that was like worthy of it actually all being written in a book kind of thing. And if he'd just be a nobody otherwise. Whereas I feel like maybe back then he caused like a huge stir and he didn't quite get to the level of Jesus, but maybe he was like 90% there in terms of the things that he actually did and like the following that he sort of then sort of sparked and the way he kind of changed mm-hmm. people's minds and things. And yeah, sort of <laughs> doing like a much bigger act and dying for something is actually demonstrates like skin in the game behind this belief and Mm -hmm. actually getting people to kind of follow you and stuff it's Mm -hmm. quite fascinating like his whole period before in the last few hours of death when he sort of takes the poison and he's sort of like well i'm going to be silent and just sort of accept my (laughs) my death and he just lies there passively and then it's just like just before he dies his last words are oh we we owe a cock to the neighbor by the way (laughs) and then that's it (laughs) then he stops and and then he just lets out a bit of a scream of pain yeah, it was kind of funny the way he was sort of so like honorful and godly in his way of dying, apart from just this random thing. It's like, oh yeah, don't forget this like, little death. Yeah, I think because uh, you said that uh, we might not have known of him if he didn't die there. I think it's also important to know that Socrates never wrote such stuff down himself. So everything we know of him was actually written by his followers. And so in this book, it was written by Plato. And there are some other accounts of him written by some of his other followers, some important Greeks. So that's important to know. What I personally took away was Socrates is one of the few humans which had a minimal influence of cognitive dissonance on his life. So co- cognitive dissonance is the possibility by humans to hold into their belief two opposing things. A good example of cognitive dissonance is a picture I saw of a girl who just went to the McDonald's and who, who posted a picture of her drink. And she said, like, look, I didn't take a straw because I care for the environment. And so she's sitting in her car and you can see that the car is like this huge, huge American pickup truck that uses how many liters of gas per, like super inefficient. And so that is the cognitive dissonance where she thinks she's doing something good for the environment by not using straws. But then on the other hand, she's using one of the most inefficient cars on the planet. (laughs) What about like Trump claiming he's some kind of science super genius and then like a month later being like, so if we inject disinfectant, like we're all going to be saved. I think in this case, it would be Trump who was denying coronavirus 
and then a few weeks later saying, but I knew it all along and I was the first one to say. Mm. Uh, we could probably go forever on drunk idiot things. That's <laughs> fake. That's <laughs> yes. Yeah. Anyway, back to yeah. cosmic distance. Well, I mean, the, the, I think the, the, it's interesting. And I think that uh, Socrates is a good sign. Like he tries to take every argument to the extreme. It's something that cognitive dissonance actually doesn't do, you know, with the girl, with the straw, if, if she thinks, okay, I'm not using a straw because I care for the environment, but this means if I'm doing this, then I shouldn't also be driving this type of car and I sh- et cetera. And so he takes that to the extreme because he lives in ultimate poverty and he doesn't ask for any money for what he's doing because he only cares about justice. And I found it pretty refreshing that someone can be so consistent. I did notice myself thinking more extreme and taking thoughts and opinions to their logical conclusion and see what influence they have on other things that I might be doing. So that's uh, one other takeaway I took in this. And then, I mean, the main takeaway is still the way he convinces and makes arguments, especially when he's in a conversation or in a discussion where he lets other people discover the facts instead of just putting them out there. I think he'd probably spend that his entire life getting better at doing that. And I think he just yes. like, enjoys that. And I think he kind of enjoyed the challenge of setting himself for that task for the trial, I think. So I think it was like 215 to 240 votes against or something. So it was kind of close. And I think he was probably kind of happy with that result. <laughs> In some ways, obviously would have liked to have got better. But yeah, I think he spent the whole time sort of being like aware that people were being completely wrong, just finding different ways to sort of see if he could get them to believe differently. My girlfriend always tells me this. I, I like to uh, go into discussions and to debate about mm-hmm. things. And one of the things I do, especially when I'm at home with my family, is I give an opinion, which is usually pretty dramatic, or I say something dramatic, which is not necessarily my opinion, but I just want to see their reactions. And then afterwards, I try to prove that I'm correct, which very often has the opposite effect. So if you start off a discussion with something too dramatic, it's very difficult to get the others to agree with you. And Mm. that's something that Socrates doesn't do. You know, he builds it up very slowly and he gets the agreement of his conversation partners every step of the way. And that is something I think useful to do when you're trying to convince someone of something. Because convincing someone of something is, I think, one of the hardest things to do. Because if someone believes a certain thing, proving, well, telling them they're wrong is probably one of the worst things you can do. And so getting them to see your point of view, which is opposite from theirs, is difficult. They need to discover it in themselves, as they say, which is a very hard thing to learn. And you kind of, yeah, you get better at it over time of mm-hmm. seeing how it just doesn't help <laughs> telling people that they're wrong and sort of trying to find ways to influence conversations. So it's super useful to study these kind of things. Everyone goes like law debating, obviously, but just to getting your own way and like having influence of being in a team and getting decisions to go in the direction you want them to, whether it's like your work colleagues or just at home and you're wanting to like change what you're eating for dinner or something. Like it's still definitely very different ways that you can do them and vastly mm-hmm. different effects. Fully agree. Cool. All right. So yeah, that's it for this episode. Cheers. Ciao. Thank you very much for listening. If you enjoyed the chat with Nico, then I run a podcast with him called Wiser Than Yesterday podcast, where each episode we review a different book that is designed for self-improvement. We've done a series on money, a series on business, a series on stoicism and ancient philosophy, a series on racism, and I think it's a very good listen if you enjoy books and or self-improvement. On that, thank you very much for listening to the show. If you are feeling generously inclined, then a five-star rating on Spotify or Apple would make me incredibly happy. Ratings, if you didn't know it, are a bit like catnip for podcasters, but if you are not able to give a good rating right now, then try sharing the show with a friend who will, or of course, wait for the show to improve. Now, much more importantly, life is to be enjoyed, and it's worth remembering that enjoyment should not be put off until some point in the future. As Socrates said, the biggest virtue is to be the person you pretend to be. So don't pretend to be happy with your life when actually you're living through the burdens you put on yourself every single day. Make the changes to be the person you want to be. And whilst you're at it, be kind and honest to yourself and willing to embrace a growth mindset and the fact that you might be wrong. And of course, remember to be kind to someone else too, which might even mean telling them that they're an idiot who knows nothing. But... Try not to be quite as rude as Socrates and do it a bit more compassionately and your friend might thank you for it as opposed to getting angry and killing you as the people of ancient Greece did to Socrates. And on that, have a nice day.